Uh, okay. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the organizer for uh, for the invitation and. Uh, hello. It's not on. Or? Uh, okay. It's much better. Okay. So yeah. So this uh, is about learning quantum states with generative models, which is this idea that we can try to uh, use generative models as a way to represent quantum states. All right. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so many people ask me about Vector Institute. So, uh, so Vector Institute is um, an independent, non-for-profit entity dedicated to research in artificial intelligence, uh, with a focus on excellence in machine learning and deep learning, and that includes uh, applications in natural sciences, right? Like, and so I, I do the quantum physics at Vector somehow, and it, was, it launched in 2017 with uh, support from the government of Ontario, the government of Canada, and the private sector. Okay, so that's quickly uh, what it is. So and these are some of the researchers, most notably uh, Jeff Hinton, Rich uh, Zemel, Alana Spurguzic, uh, Sanya Fleet, Fiddler, and, and many more. Okay, so it's a group, uh, big team of uh, researchers. Um, uh, this is how it looks on a good day. So, uh, um, okay, it's a big space with monitors. and. Um, and people, <laughs> and but these are my machine learning friends, like uh, people with uh, whom I interact, uh, in at, like at the intersection between uh, many body physics and machine learning. So uh, Guglielmo Mazzola, Giuseppe Carleo, who is one of the organizers, uh, Esan Hatami, Leandro Olita, uh, Roger Melko, Giacomo, Matthias Stroyer, Peter Brocker, Kelvin, and uh, Simon Reps. Uh, and um, okay, and. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the, uh, like the, the reason why I think machine learning and, uh, may be helpful for us, like in quantum anybody physics, okay? And the, the, I guess the, the most important thing is that the generic uh, specification of a quantum state usually requires, or typically, not typically, but requires resources exponentially large in the number of degrees of freedom for generic states, okay? So this, in quantum mechanics, the, the wave function is just this incredibly high dimensional vector, like which grows exponentially with the number of degrees of freedoms in the system. And, and um, so that, that's, if you want, that's uh, how you specify states in quantum physics. And uh, so it's very difficult to handle for, for, like, um, for interesting systems. And so even with today's uh, best supercomputers, we can solve the wave equation, the Schrodinger equation for uh, exactly for a, like a really tiny system, like with uh, as ma at most like around 45 particles, right? Like so, so it's a very challenging problem, and it is it grows dramatically as exponential. So even for instance, uh, storing the state of a 273 spin system requires a computer with more bits than there are atoms in the universe. So you may have heard of this before. Like it's, this is exponential growth, right? Like. Um, but uh, technologically relevant uh, problems in chemistry, condensed matter, and quantum computing are, are much larger than, than 273, right? Uh, so here I have an example. So it's uh, chemistry, solid state physics, uh, and so on. And uh, so what do we do, okay? So this uh, hope, this quantum computing that we may be able to use in the future, and it will probably help us solve some of these problems, but uh, we're, still, we're still trying to figure out how to how to build uh, quantum computers, right? Like so, um, so what what do we do, right? Like I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's uh, still hope for classical algorithms, right? Like because uh, nature is compassionate or benevolent, and in the sense that uh, many body systems can be typically characterized with uh, an amount of information which is smaller than this maximum capacity, right? Like this exponential, and um, and so, and that's what we exploit when we do numerics, for instance. So in quantum Monte Carlo, what we do is we do statistical sampling of this gigantic state space, and uh, we can solve some uh, specific problems uh, in terms of this uh, um, stochastic uh, uh, exploration of the state space. We can get correlation functions, um, and it's relatively successful. The other um, uh, technique, for instance, are those inspired by tensor networks, which exploit 
the low entanglement uh, and some in, in, in the physical states that uh, are of interest to uh, condensed matter physicists and quantum information theorists. And what they do is just they, they exploit this low entanglement and they take, uh, for instance, a generic wave function and then they factorize it in terms of uh, uh, smaller tensors. Okay. Um, and, and, and so we're still using a limited amount of resources and we're still making progress right? along this direction using uh, still a classical uh, calculation. Right? I guess what, what I would like to say or to uh, encourage or to discuss is that, um, or, or to, uh, to tell you is that machine learning community uh, deals with um, equally high dimensional problems. Okay? Like for instance, um, uh, they study, I don't know, image recognition and so, or language translation and so on, and those problems are really high dimensional too. Okay, so, and I, I give you, for instance, what's um, the, the, like a typical size for a, a data set, the famous one is MNIST. It, it has images which are 28 by 28, and they're binary, right? Like, and the size of the state space for that system is 2 to 256, which is really large, okay? And, um, but yet, they, they battled this uh, so-called curse of dimensionality with uh, successful and impressive results in a wide uh, spectrum of scientific um, and technologically relevant areas. Uh, and like, it, so it's, re it's really interesting, right? Like, so I guess the, the, the question is, like, uh, is there like, um, uh, okay, here we have Cono Monte Carlo tensor networks. There's then neural networks, right? Like as a new way to think about those wave functions and these states and and, 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 and so that's what we want to explore in like when we uh, say or when we think about like learning quantum states with, with this generative models or, or neural networks, okay? Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so, and so in physics, so it's, it hasn't been the exception, so there's a lot of work happening right now in, in, in this area. So there's like, kind of like this different branches and so on. So machine learning, phases of matter, phase transitions and so on. Um, there's new inspired ansatz for quantum anybody systems, which I will discuss briefly. This uh, acceleration of Monte Carlo simulations by uh, Lei Wang and some others here in the room. This quantum state preparation, renormalization group uh, analysis um, uh, of uh, PCA and so on. This quantum state tomography um, with using this uh, probabilistic models. Uh, machine learning based decoders for, uh, for uh, quantum computing. Uh, the supervised learning inspired by a tensor network, which is kind of like going the opposite way, like using techniques in uh, tensor networks to help machine learning and, um, and supervised learning. Then there's uh, quantum Boltzmann machines, which are kind of like uh, quantum machine learning in the sense that they try to uh, use uh, quantum computers to solve machine learning tasks um, and so on. Okay, so there's a lot uh, of uh, interest and um, and, um, and and discussions and, and new work and, and it is exciting. Um, so right now, so what I'm going to tell you is like kind of like my personal uh, story of how I got into uh, learning quantum states. Okay, with with this general models and it's kind of like a going from supervised learning to quantum states. So it's very personal and uh, so let me discuss that quickly. Yeah. So I'll try to go fast. Uh, so the idea is, okay, so I, I, I like to introduce this in the context of the icing model, right? Like, which is this uh, icing ferromagnet in two dimensions where you have spins which are mm, like the classical variables plus or minus one. And here you have uh, that at low temperature, the spins tend to magnetize up or down. And as you warm the system up, then you transition into a disordered state. It's a paramagnet, okay? So this is um, a well-known... Uh, model and it has been solved and, uh, by uh, Lars Onsager and, and we know everything about it basically, okay? But um, it has like a, this is the phase diagram, so at uh, low temperature you have a ferromagnet and high temperature you have a paramagnet separated by a phase transition, a second order phase transition, um, where you have um, at low temperature you have a magnet, finite magnetization and high temperature uh, it's just zero, okay? And so that's the system that I'm interested in and how I started thinking about this uh, ideas in, in machine learning and uh, so the inspiration came from this uh, fluctuations of handwritten digits okay where you have a big bunch of numbers written by people okay so it's a famous data set in machine learning and um, 
I guess the idea is that you give uh, the, the machine learning algorithm a, a, a handwritten digit uh, five, for instance, and then the, you use a neural net or the machine learning community develop these ne powerful neural networks. And, and what they do is they basically translate an image into a label, okay, like that the computer can understand. So you go from an image, which is handwritten by people and so on, and you get a label. It's a five, right? Like that the computer can understand. Okay, so again, and so I guess my, my intuition was, okay, like a, that a five, like a written by a human, looks like a perfect five or a mean field five, plus some fluctuations due to the fact that we write down five in different ways, okay? And then that, uh, that the, what the machine learning was doing was just kind of like, uh, kind of like recognizing like this mean field uh, part of the five, which the computer can understand, okay? So then, so that was the idea. So that then I say, okay, maybe we can use this uh, neural networks to recognize these phases, right? Like this fur magnets or this high temperature phases. And, and that's what we did, right? Like we just train a similar uh, neural network to recognize these digits, okay? And then of course this works, it's a very simple task, but um, I'm just telling you how I got started, right? Like, so this is how, how we did it, right? Like we uh, figured out how to train these models to recognize these um, snapshots at low temperature and high temperature, okay? And then, so this is what we found that, uh, that you, can, you can basically recognize this and, uh, and that eventually this neural network is able to, uh, to basically compute the critical temperature too. It's able to detect the, the critical temperature of the model and it exhibits even uh, uh, kind of like uh, signals of uh, critical behavior and so on. You can extract critical exponents um, out of uh, this numerically trained uh, neural networks and so on. And uh, there's also an interesting exercise that we did, which is um, we trained the model on the square lattice and then we were able to detect the uh, critical temperature of the triangular lattice, right? Like, so this kind of like ideas of uh, generalization and so on apply also in this context. You can even change dimensionality, right? Like, so if you take a model trained in 2D, it can detect phase transitions in 3D, uh, so long as they have the same order parameter and so on. And so we came up with an analytical understanding of what the neural network is doing. Uh, and so what it is doing is actually learn, uh, measuring the order parameters and so on. So it's how I, I got started. Then we, we, th okay, we thought, oh, can we then extend this to or like a less trivial phases, right? Like, uh, or phases of matter. And so we had a look at uh, topological phases of matter and we, because we thought this were important and so on, they don't have any order parameters. So like the order parameter is what makes these images um, easy to recognize, right? Like when you see this, you immediately know, oh, that looks like a ferromagnet. Or when you see this, oh, that looks very likely like a, an uh, like a ferromagnet, right? Like, but uh, but with, um, with topological phases of matter, they don't have an order parameter, so they look a little bit different, right? Like, uh, so we studied, uh, this Wegener icing gauge theory. It's a classical gauge theory um, defined on the plaquettes of, uh, on the, um, like with spins, like, or this classical variables plus or minus one defined on the bonds of, of the square lattice. And the Hamiltonian is basically a product over the uh, spins on a, on a plaquette, okay? And uh, this is it's a very interesting um, gauge theory. It has two phases. At zero temperature, it has a, ground state that is uh, classically disordered, but it has topological order, okay? And a high temperature is just the disorder paramagnet, okay? But the interesting thing is that the zero temperature phase has no order parameter, okay? So disorder and has zero correlation length. Um, so so here, here are two configurations of that, of that model, like drawn from the Boltzmann distribution of that model. So one of them is ground state and the other one is uh, infinite temperature, uh, state and then as you see it's like much harder to distinguish right like between the two so then that the, qu the question was can these neural networks learn uh to distinguish between the two right like so i guess would you like to guess which one is which just as a joke <laughs> it's much harder right like uh, that, i guess that's the point right but um so this one is a ground state and this one is a high infinite temperature state of uh, of the model and uh Indeed, this fit for one neural networks, uh, they struggle learning the difference between the two, but uh, when you introduce uh, more information into the ansatz, uh, for instance, in terms of um, a convolutional neural network that brings back, uh, if you want information about the dimensionality of the system and the locality, 
then then you the, this neural network succeeds at uh, recognizing these different uh, patterns, right? Like, uh, and um, and the picture that we draw analytically is that this uh, convolutional neural networks uh, distinguish faces based upon the satisfied uh, local constraints uh, of the gauge theory, which is this basically whether or not this plaquettes in the um, <clears throat> in, in, in the square lattice satisfy this constraints imposed by the Hamiltonian. Yeah. So two by two is in, in, so two by two is enough because they cover this plaquettes, yes. Uh, it's easier to train, right? Because it has just enough information to do it. Um, yeah. These are the spins. I will do that. Uh, so the question is, are this uh, the spins or the procs over the plaquettes? And the answer is, these are the spins, right? Like so. If you do the plaquettes, it's even easier because now they look like a, a completely ordered, like a ferromagnet versus a completely random. So it's way easier when you do the plaquettes. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we came up with an analytical understanding like, of, of like, what the neural network should do and so on, and this is how it looks like. So it's a convolutional neural network with uh, two by two filters and uh, 16 of them on each uh, plaquette. And then that fully connected to um, to the output, okay? And uh, so then you get hundred percent accuracy in the test sets, and so this is a question. Of course, those work, right? Like this, these systems are well understood uh, in terms of physical quantities. More about like the exploration that. Um, I, I, yeah, so I don't know, right? I haven't tried that. I was just trying to explore how neural networks connect to quantum states and so on. And this is like this was my path, right? Like, uh, uh, but of course, many things work, especially for the icing model, like the initial one. This is super easy, right? Like. Uh, but this one is a little bit um, trickier, right? Like, so some neural networks can't solve this problem. At least you can think about a, an analytical solution in principle, but uh, when you try numerically, you can't, okay? Like, it's hard to converge. But. Okay, so I have a lot more to say. <laughs> um, so then, so, okay, so this is where I got to quantum states, right? Like, so what, I, what we realize is that. Uh, this uh, neuron that classifies uh, the ground st the ground states of this classical uh, system, they I mean it behaves like the so like the ground state of the uh, quantum error correcting code uh, this that Kitaev introduced. Okay, so so if you want, so this is where it connected the, the classification problem to the Kitaev storic code. Okay, so what we found out is okay, so Kitaev storic code is if you want this piece, which you had in the gauge theory, in this classical gauge theory, plus some term defined on the vertices of the plaquette, okay? And what we realize is that uh, this convolutional neural network or the call neuron or the neuron that detects ground state behaves like the ground state of the toric code, okay? And, and, then so, and then so we said, okay, so then if we take this call neuron that we have in the so it is performing this uh, projection over the plaquettes, and then so we, what we propose is, oh, this uh, ground state of the third code can be written down as this convolutional neural network, or the square root of this convolutional neural network. And, uh, and then I realized, oh, that's exactly uh, the same as uh, the PEX contract, uh, construction of the, of the uh, ground state for that model, okay? So this is how I, uh, kind of like my path door understanding that we could use these neural networks to um, uh, like as ground states or as wave functions in quantum many body systems, okay? So, um, so I was, uh, if you want, how I realized, uh, of course, there's m more exciting results from uh, Giuseppe here, uh, the organizer, and he, he basically um, kind of like 
extended restricted Boltzmann machines to the quantum domain and that was kind of like an exciting uh, thing in the field and so on. So let me briefly tell you what, uh, what Giuseppe found, which is he defined uh, or he took restricted Boltzmann machines, which are uh, powerful probabilistic models in, 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 in machine learning. They, they're used to describe uh, high dimensional uh, probability distributions and they can be useful to describe data sets and so on. And what he did was basically to uh, extend those to the quantum domain. Okay, so basically uh, um, you have here like a, a set of uh, visible spins or variables and they're connected to a set of variables h1 through hm uh, and what they do is they just induce uh, correlations between the spins, okay, like the actual spins. And then if you made the weights, which are traditionally just real numbers, and you made them complex, then you end up with uh, potentially very powerful answers for uh, wave functions, okay. So that was, if you want, uh, the most important uh, idea in this paper, or in my opinion. Uh, and, and then he, like using variation Monte Carlo, uh, Giuseppe and uh, Matthias Troy, have sh they, they've shown that they can get pretty accurate um, ground states of uh, some simple quantum many body systems, like the transverse fieldizing model and uh, I think the Heisenberg model and the Heisenberg model in 2D, okay? And, and he, uh, he, he got really accurate results even at the critical point, for instance. And so here, you, you're like the, this is like the error in the ground state calculation as a function of the number of uh, variables uh, age, okay, which is what makes, uh, if you want, as, they, as you grow the number of uh, hidden variables m, like those answers become more and more powerful, okay? So as you increase that, then you get more and more accurate uh, solutions to these problems. And um, not only that, he was able to, like, uh, to show that uh, you can study real-time dynamics of quantum many-body systems, at least for a short time, and uh, for, like, for instance, in the 1D transverse fieldizing model, 1D Heisenberg model, and so on. So it's exciting, and uh, um, and this is a promising research area as, uh, as far as we 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 think. Uh, um, and um, I mean, there's a lot of so Giuseppe called them neural network quantum states, okay? And and there's a lot of uh, work uh, around this area, so which I kind of like bind in these three categories, but um, they overlap, and there's more more stuff. Uh, but let's say that uh, there's theoretical and analytical results based on uh, that idea. There's numerical uh, Monte Carlo results and so on, like variational Monte Carlo and, and other ideas which are more numerical. And then there's data driven, which is kind of like the idea that you can use those models to reconstruct the quantum state out of a big bunch of measurements. Okay, so uh, so. So then, then there's a lot of work indeed. So like for instance, for theoretical and analytical results, we have uh, a ton of papers. I, I, I just uh, copy pasted a few from Google Scholar. So one of them is that these are equivalent uh, in some sense to uh, tensor network states, okay? These RBMs, these restricted Boltzmann machines. This paper by, by uh, uh, the, the authors are here, L.A. Wang and, um, and, and uh, and then there's, uh, I don't know, like uh, analytical results uh, this, uh, showing that um, this, you can write down topological uh, states of matter in terms of these RBMs. There's, uh, if there's, uh, there are theorems like, uh, where you can show that efficient representations of quantum many body states uh, um, in terms of neural networks are possible. Uh, this, how they scale, like how the entanglement of the, of the RBM scales, which is it come half volume low and so on. So there's a lot of interesting uh, works out there. Like they can represent chiral states, the um, uh, string bone states, and chiral topological states. That's the next uh, speaker um, in the, in this this morning. And, um, and and for instance, this deep learning quantum physics uh, fundamental bridge. We we heard about that uh, yesterday actually. Um, uh, there's numerical uh, and Monte Carlo results. So uh, self learning Monte Carlo which is kind of like using RBMs to accelerate uh, simu Monte Carlo simulations uh, this, uh, and more. I mean, there's a lot of uh, stuff happening in, in this area and, and it is exciting, right? Like it's kind of like a starting to explore. We still have to really show that they can do much better than other methods, but um, if you want, it's an interesting uh, research direction that I, that I think uh, is uh, promising, okay? Um, there's this uh, other data-driven uh, type of uh, research, which is basically quantum state tomography, where you take a big bunch of measurements on a quantum state, and then you 
reconstruct it. Okay? And you can use this machine learning ideas and uh, generative models and there's some research right, like, um, uh, in, the, in, in there. So, and right now, like the, for the next uh, part of uh, the talk, I'm going to discuss this idea, right? like this quantum state tomography or reconstructing um, states from, uh, measure or from experimental measurements on a quantum device. And I think, um, so let me, let me go ahead. So what is uh, quantum state tomography? And so it is the process of reconstructing a quantum state by measurements on the system, okay? And um, it is kind of like the gold standard for verification and benchmarking quantum devices, which are um, useful for, for instance, characterizing optical signals, diagnosing and detecting errors in state preparations, uh, for instance, states produced by quantum computers, uh, you can use that for uh, entanglement verification and, and so on. So it's an interesting uh, uh, research uh, topic and it's technologically relevant for like this era of like uh, quantum computing, for this coming uh, era. Um, and so, and the idea is that uh, we need to uh, go beyond the standard quantum state tomography uh, because there's a lot of progress in controlling large quantum systems, right? And so here I have several examples. I have um, cold ions, I have uh, superconducting quantum qubits, so I have here the chip by Google and uh, D-Wave, and, um, and uh, so the idea is that there's a new availability of arbitrary measurements performed with, uh, with, with a lot of uh, int uh, great accuracy on these devices, and, uh, and then so the bottleneck is not anymore like the construction of the device, if you want, I mean there's still problems, but th they're starting to scale, but then the bottleneck for the, if you want, for the, um, for the verification and for the certification of this uh, problem is the estimation of the state, which suffers this curse of dimensionality uh, due to the exponential explosion of the size of the state space, okay? So, uh, so then, so we need to go beyond standard quantum state tomography because that uh, problem scales exponentially in, in its traditional uh, formulation, okay? So here are some examples of this uh, synthetic devices uh, scaling be beyond what we can do with uh, classical um, with traditional quantum state tomography. So here we have uh, uh, many body simulation of dynamics with 51 atoms, okay, as a quantum simulator. There's an observation of uh, many body dynamical phase transition with 53. So this is observation of topological phenomena with uh, 1,800 qubits and, and quantum chemistry and so on. So there's a lot of um, uh, quantum simulations uh, happening and uh, quantum devices scaling beyond what we can really certify. So, uh, but there are approaches to, to make quantum state tomography or quantum state reconstruction efficient. So one of them is, or, or the main point or the main idea of when you do that, or when you try to do that, is you, that you introduce a parameterization of the quantum state that uh, scales well with the, um, with the size of the system but that has interesting structural information. Okay, so we need to introduce some structure into the problem, uh, and so we, if you want, we pay a price in the, the generality of the approach, but we can still handle like large set of uh, interesting states um, that that we care about, right? Like so, and then so, for instance, in, uh, in this, like if you want, the, one of the prominent techniques is using matrix product states and matrix matrix product operators for quantum state tomography, right? Like and. Uh, basically, what you do is you you you, you take one of uh, those answers, this uh, factorization of the uh, state in terms of, of uh, tensors, and and you do this reconstruction, right? Like so. Um, <clears throat> so it's interesting. It's a scalable. It has all sorts of advantages, but it also has limitations. So, for instance, you can uh, easily apply it to to one D, but it's more challenging in two D, for instance, and three D. Um, uh, there's also a different approach, which is using neural net. Right, like that. Uh, so you introduce a parameterization using uh, the RBM, like this restricted Boltzmann machine, or this quantum or neural network quantum states, and 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 you do this reconstruction, and, and that works, and that has been extended um, to um, to even uh, mixed uh, states, but uh, with some restrictions. Uh, I guess so. I guess what I want to tell you today is about a new uh, approach to to solve this problem, is which basically we where we combine uh, neural networks and some simple easy tensor networks, okay? And so I guess the key uh, technical insight that we bring is 
that we're not going to parameterize the state directly, but we parameterize Born's rule, okay, in terms of uh, generative models. And we use just a big bunch of uh, measurements that are informationally complete, and they're based upon informationally complete positive operator value measures, POVM. And uh, so the ANSATS, uh, like in terms of uh, tensor networks, it looks like this. So here you have uh, neural probabilistic models that I uh, write down this way. It's a, a black box. And then a set of uh, tensors which are defined in terms of the measurements I'm going to apply to the quantum system. Okay? So that's the idea. Um, so, so basically, so this box here, this big giant tensor, is uh, either a recurrent neural network that looks like this, or a restricted Boltzmann machine. But the approach works for any generative model um, that you can think of. Okay, so th so this is the strategy, right? Like so we so we we apply a set of measurements m. And uh, we basically relate that uh, the statistics of the measurements, um, which is given by the Born rule, PA, the trace of uh, rho, rho is my state, and that times the measurement that, that we use. And, and that what we do is we parameterize uh, PA, which is the outcome statistics of the measurements, as a, what we think about it as an unsupervised learning problem, and we learn, we try to learn PA. Okay, so that's the, the insight. And um, this probabilistic model can be anything. It can be a variational autoencoder, it can be a restricted Boltzmann machine, uh, generative adversarial networks, autoregressive models, basically any probabilistic model. All right, and um, so that's the, if you want, it has a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, the techniques that you can use for this type of reconstructions. Um, so the mes like for the measurements, so we're going to use uh, positive operator value measures. They're basically uh, a set of uh, measurements or operator operators that, uh, if you want, describe the measurements that we're going to apply on the quantum system. And uh, I guess the most important thing is that they're informationally complete. And that means that, um, that you can, uh, you, I mean, it means many things, but uh, one of them is that you can span any operator in terms of this... Uh, uh, operators in, in this Hilbert space, okay? The other thing uh, that uh, this information complete this means is that the Born rule, this PA, contains all the information about the state, okay? So it's all like statements of the, of the same um, um, aspect and, uh, and as I said, uh, this Born rule defines this distribution of the, of the just generalized measurements, okay? And so this is for a single qubit, and then what we do is for multi-qubit systems, we use, we do tensor products of uh, single qubit uh, measurements. And this is because um, when you go ahead and you log in onto your like, favorite quantum computer, these are the measurements that you will, uh, that you will be able to use. Okay, just single qubit um, uh, information complete uh, measurements if you define them this way, okay? Um, Okay, so, and, and here's a tensor network representation of this POVM that we use, okay? It's basically this yellow balls, right? Like where the uh, vertical lines, they mean the physical indices, they act on the uh, physical degrees of freedom, and this uh, outcome in lines, they are the outcome uh, indices, the measurement outcome of the, of the measurement, okay? And... Um, so I guess the key point also about the information completeness is that um, you, when you use a, an information complete uh, uh, POVM or positive operator value measure, what you can do is you can invert this relation, this uh, born rule relation of the measurement and the density matrix, and, the, uh, um, and that you, so that you can invert it, right? Like, so here we have P of A in terms of rho, I guess what I'm trying to say is that when you use this type of measurements, you can get, then write rho in terms of uh, p, okay? And then that's what we use, right? Like, uh, so this slide is it, it, not important. What, what's important here is this equation that writes the density matrix in terms of uh, the probability distribution and a set of tensors that we can efficiently compute um, because of the fact that so because of the way we define the, this measurements, okay? 
So, uh, so ultimately, so our model for the density matrix is a generative model here that I uh, represent with this giant tensor and a set of tensors that are factorized, right? Like so, it's so that it is easy to handle analytically or numerically. Um, I guess I emphasized this already, but uh, it it works. It works for any uh, probabilistic model, and uh, so this, that's the flexibility of the approach. Um, so let me show you some results on um, on uh, synthetic uh, data sets. Okay, so here I have a pure G set uh, state, where like you, basically you have a big bunch of spins uh, where they like a superposition of uh, spins where like all of them are zero plus one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, and then, so the other thing is, well, we, so this is a pure state, but we can also apply some local depolarization on, on the state. And then, um, so that we have uh, like a mixed uh, density matrix, right? Like, and this locally, local depolarization is just a model for, of decoherence, right? Like where a qubit, uh, with probability one minus p is just left untouched, and with probability p there's an error in this state. Okay, um, and, and so we we want to learn this out of uh, this uh, set of measurements. Um, okay, so here's like the lear the learning uh, pro the learning process of this uh, local uh, locally depolarized G Z state. So this is for two just two qubits, and so here I plot the Kullback library divergence, which is kind of like a measure, it's not really a measure, it's like a divergence between the probability distributions given by the uh, Born rule and the and my model. And as you see, as function of the training of the model, this div divergence goes to zero pretty quickly, and uh, which means that you're learning effectively this distribution. Um, here's an, an, another measurement. Uh, the uh, the um, if you want the fidelity uh, is given by this expression here is kind of like also a, a measurement of fidelity between these two distributions, the distributions of the actual state and uh, my model. Okay, and as you see, as function of the training, it just quickly reaches one. And finally, there's this quantum fidelity, which is a standard measurement of um, um, similarity or proximity between density matrices. And it also quickly goes to one as you train. Okay, so this is um, basically obtained by parameterizing this Born rule with uh, with this restricted Boltzmann machine, and um, it seems to be uh, working pretty well. Um, the only, I guess, the only difference with the standard restricted Boltzmann machine is that we use four states per qubit because the measurement that we use has four outcomes uh, per qubit. So we need a little bit of an extension of the restricted Boltzmann machine, but that was introduced by uh, Hinton and uh, Salahuddin of, in the context of collaborative filtering, okay? Um, um, but, so, but then we wanted to scale the whole thing. We wanted to study GHZ states that go beyond what we can do with the traditional approaches, right? Like, so that was for two qubits, but we wanted to go to, I don't know, 40 or 80 qubits, and um, so, but we were able. To, so we were we weren't able to do it with the restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, but then we we came up with this uh, uh, recurrent neural network uh, language model. So it's kind of like this um, machine learning techniques that are used for language translation. So when we you go and type on Google Translate, this and that. So this is what they use. They use recurrent neural network uh, models and. What we did was we took one of those uh, machine learning uh, translation models and then we applied it to the learning of this GZ uh, states. And once we used uh, those uh, techniques, this recurrent neural networks, we were able to go up to 40 and 80 qubits and we were able to re retrieve the state, um, the GZ state with a uh, big number of qubits um, with high fidelity. Okay, so. Um, uh, so a little bit of the details about the model is basically uh, you stack uh, three of these re uh, re uh, recurrent neural network uh, units, and then at the end you attach a fully connected layer with a softmax. So it's a little bit of a technical. Yeah. Um, 
It's the number. So the question is, what plays the role of uh, temporal? Uh, so recurrent neural nets are usually defined in terms of uh, time, like and recurrence, and they usually used for se uh, sequential data. But um, here, what we did is at each time step, we replaced that for the statistics, the statistics, statistics of each qubit. Okay. So it's if you want, if you put them in space, so the state doesn't have uh, a spatial structure, but if you put them on a line, all those qubits. Um, so it, it's really uh, look, uh, putting each time step at uh, each location of the qubit. Yeah. Okay. So and we, we also investigated the the sample sample complexity of the learning, and so it's basically um, the the fidelity that you attain in your reconstruction as a function of the number of measurements that you apply on your quantum state. Okay, and um, as you, ideally, so as, as you probably imagine, as you grow, the number of uh, samples that you uh, get out of the model or out of your state or the measurements you, that you apply in the state, so the, the fidelity of the reconstruction um, approaches one, okay? So, and it does so in a, in a relatively uh, fast way. And um, so this is for, um, I think, for, the, for one type of measurement, it's called... Um, the tetrahedral measurement, and this is for a Pauli POVM, so it's a different types of measurements. But what we found is that um, if you fix, uh, I don't know, fidelity, for instance, to 0 0.99, and you measure the number of uh, uh, experimental measurements that you have to apply, what we found is that uh, they scale approximately linear with the size of the system, okay? Which we found um, um, not surprising because this is a relatively simple state, but uh, still, uh, we thought it was a very favorable scaling, right? Like that you can learn uh, this state um, even at uh, a number of qubits as big as 80 with um, a linear uh, number of measurements, okay? So that was, uh, if you want this uh, sample complexity of the, of the learning of the GZ state. Um, and finally, we... The which P? Um, oh, P, sorry, yeah, so P is the error, right? So, so we, we were talking about um, that we were going to reconstruct G set states, and so the G set state can be either pure, uh, which is this uh, state, but then we were also going to study um, a locally depolarized, uh, generalized G set state where uh, you apply a error in the qubit at the rate of uh, P. So it's kind of like the probability of uh, finding an error in the in this state, okay? And um, and so yeah, so so this is uh, the reconstruction for different uh, values of p. And as you can imagine, or as you can see from here, um, it's easier to learn uh, uh, the state at uh, large p, which is kind of like because at, at very large uh, p, basically what you have, you end up with with a very easy distribution. Uh, uh, basically completely random, so basically a constant. And so those are like, it's super easy to learn, it's you just learning a constant, okay? So that's why we find uh, that uh, the noisy states are easier to learn. Uh, another way to phrase this is that um, the, the state at uh, 0p has more information than the state at, um, at p equals 0.4, for instance, okay? Um, so yeah, so it's very favorable, favorable uh, scaling. Uh, and then finally, so we wanted to uh, see if we could apply this type of ideas to the reconstruction of ground states of uh, local Hamiltonians. Um, so we started with the transverse lysing model in 1D, the, the, uh, the anti-ferromagnetic um, um, transverse lysing model. Okay, so it's this system, it's in 1D. We took a chain of uh, 50 spins and um, and as, 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 as I was mentioned before, we use this uh, recurrent neural network model in the reconstruction of the distribution PA. Um, and we use, again, this three layer, um, uh, three stack uh, layers of um, um, recurrent neural network model. So it's a language model again. Uh, and so here, reconstructions of uh, correlation functions compared to the synthetic state that we use. The synthetic state we, uh, we obtain using density matrix for normalization group. And uh, for the synthetic state, the uh, expectation value, for instance, of sigma uh, x 
um, is this um, orange and the reconstructed one, the recurrent neural network one, is this green, which matches very well with the, with the numerical one, with the G uh, sorry, the DMRG one. And these are two body correlations, so sigma one, sigma i, along the z direction. Okay, and as you see, there's a good agreement um, with, uh, between DMRG and what we reconstructed. Uh, and like uh, so here like we okay so all these uh, states are very simple right like uh, um, the GHZ state uh, and the transphilizing model they all have very uh, simple structure they can even be written in terms of uh, uh, a probabilistic model because th there's a if you want a rotation of the model such that the ground state is always positive right like so, but then, uh, so we wanted to explore a model that is a little bit more uh, complicated in that we don't understand the sign structure of the state uh, so well. And so we studied the, um, um, the Heisenberg model in 2D, okay, on the triangular lattice. So this model um, is, is very interesting, it has a, an order ground, uh, magnetically ordered ground state, uh, but it has a non-trivial sign structure. So the ground state is, is not positive. Okay, and we wanted to see if we could reconstruct uh, this, uh, um, the ground state of this Hamiltonian uh, using this recurrent neural network uh, model. And uh, so what we did was, okay, so it's, now it's a two-dimensional model, and, but we still have this recurrent neural network model. So what we did was we basically labeled the, the spins in the lattice, and then we basically snaked the recurrent neural network model as uh, along the... Um, spins in the, in the lattice, okay? Pretty much like what they do in, in the symmetric renormalization group when they apply it to, to, uh, dim, uh, to systems in, in two dimensions, okay? And, um, and so then we tried, we played this game, right? Like we took these measurements, we uh, tried to reconstruct the, uh, the state using the, uh, this recurrent neural network model. And so these are examples of the results that we found. So these are the, the sigma 1, sigma r correlation function, so, so two-body correlation function, and this is for the synthetic state, and um, this is for the reconstructed state, okay, which matches uh, pretty well, okay, and uh, which means that um, we can tackle, if you want, a little bit more challenging problems. Uh, so there's still uh, local Hamiltonians and so on, so there's a lot of structure, but, uh, but this one at least doesn't have the positive um, wave function, so we, it can handle the, the, all this type of uh, situations, and um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the I, I'll repeat the question. So the question is, how does it compare with uh, standard techniques for quantum state tomography? So, so first of all, um, so. You can't apply standard techniques at this uh, size. So standard techniques uh, scale exponentially. So you, you stop at about, I think, 10 qubits, if I remember correctly. And so that, if you want, that stops right there. So, and, but this one has 64 uh, spins. So from that perspective, it's just uh, not doable, OK? And uh, the other thing is you could, in principle, apply this MPS techniques, but I haven't seen results in 2D for quantum state tomography. Okay. Um, so with this, I conclude. So we're starting to explore a machine learning perspective on the many-body problem, and, um, and both in classical and uh, quantum physics. And um, we can discriminate uh, phases and phase transitions, both conventional uh, and topological, using these neural nets. Um, we've, we have performed quantum state tomography or quantum state reconstruction based on neural networks and uh, these results are kind of like better than uh, the other methods and, and, and they enable us to study 2D and hopefully in the future three-dimensional uh, quantum systems and quantum devices. And uh, so just like a final remark is I believe there are a lot of opportunities for us physicists at the intersection between machine learning and, uh, and physics, right? Like, so thank you.